This week's episode of the Art Tactic Podcast is brought to you by Artbase. Are you managing an art collection, an artist studio, or even a gallery? Is it time to bring your collection management skills up to a professional level? Well, Artbase is the right software to manage your art business. Artbase allows you to track your artworks and contacts in an easy-to-use, powerful database. You just enter your data once and use that data to generate reports, offers, contracts, and so much more. And they've got a brand new version out right now with a whole new look that can be used on the cloud from any location on any device. So what are you waiting for? Go to artbase.com to learn more and be sure to mention Art Tactic for a 15% discount. Thanks for listening to the Art Tactic Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Green. Over the past decade, art fairs have drastically changed the contemporary art market and how contemporary art galleries operate. They're very polarizing. Some love them, some dread the thought of visiting another one of them, and some experience both of these feelings. Regardless of your position on them, their impact is undeniable. So in this week's episode, we wanted to really understand the origins of art fairs, when did they begin, how different were they than they are today, and what might art fairs look like in the future. So in this week's episode of the podcast, we chat with Melanie Gerlis, Arc Market columnist for the Financial Times, and author of the brand new book, The Art Fair Story, A Roller Coaster Ride, which is available now in the UK, and you can pre-order it if you're outside of the UK by visiting Amazon or wherever you get your books. So hope you enjoy this episode with Melanie. Thanks so much for listening. <music> Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you very much for having me, Adam. So art fairs, of course, are a major part of the contemporary art market today, but I don't think many people know the history or origin of art fairs. And you really explore this in your new book, The Art Fair Story, A Roller Coaster Ride. So when and where did art fairs begin, and was the motivation for them the same that it is today, to sell art, to meet clients? Thank you, Adam. And yes, as you say, in a way, the bulk of the book is the history of fairs because, well, because no one has done a history of the fairs before. Um, But obviously, it's impossible. It was impossible to write about the history of fairs without also looking at the context of of today and their, their future. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of you, you could date art fairs, and I, I you know, I do date back to medieval marketplaces, you know, around pilgrimages, and and so on and so forth. It's just a way of getting lots of people in one place at one time. Um, there was an art fair in the 15th century in art in Antwerp called Our Lady's Pad. I mean, I think they pan, they sold other things other than art, but there was definitely art sold there. And then I also talk about things like the great exhibitions so that, that started in, in London and Paris and were really, you know, ways, temporary exhibitions of lots and lots of things around the world. And you can draw a huge number of parallels. But then realistically, you know, looking at the modern day art fair, there were a few pre-war, you know, the Grosvenor House Art Fair in in, uh, in London um, started before the before the wars, the Second World War. Um, but the book really starts in the 1960s um, with with Art Cologne, which which was founded in 1967. And that was really the first fair to do what we think fairs do today, as you say. And it really, I, I, absolutely, as you say, it started because they wanted to, you know, a few, a couple of dealers in Germany of contemporary art didn't know how to attract people to contemporary art. And I think that's one of the big differences really between between then and now is it's quite hard to imagine a world where no museum exhibitions no auctions were dedicated to contemporary art the only way to see the art of your time was to to go to have a gallery near you that happened to show someone you were interested in and you felt welcome and really if the fair started to to galvanize attention on a very unloved and and unlooked after um, area there are a lot of contemporary art collectors who are just starting off and haven't even been to a fair or have only been to a few the past few years. And even likely most seasoned collectors aren't intimately familiar with the history of modern art fairs. It'd be great if you could provide us with more context on the modern art fair history and what are a few of the most pivotal moments in the history of modern art fairs 
that resulted in significant shifts in the significance of art fairs within the art market? Yeah, I mean, I think to, to contextualize, the pivotal moments were really outside of art fairs. They were just, they were what enabled art fairs to happen. So the first, if you like, pivotal moment is is the Second World War. And, and because of the Second World War, you know, you get a lot of creatives, artists, brilliant people who either died or left Europe. Um, so there was this great need in Europe to, to, to revitalize, to re-energize um, a creative industry. And you then get you then get sort of art market moments uh, mapping what's going on outside. I mean, I interviewed um, the brilliant old master stealer Johnny Van Heften, who said that in you know in 1970, um, a Velasquez painting sold an auction for the equivalent of, of 2.3 million. So it was actually 2.2 million guineas. It wasn't, it was before decimalization. Um, and that was the first time anyone realized that the amount of money and interest that that was that could be made from art. You then get in the US the, the rather infamous skull auction um, a few years later. And that was the first time. So we're not talking about an old master work anymore. We're talking about contemporary art by living artists being sold, you know, with the artists in the room, with the collector in the room. And it became, art was suddenly a spectator sport. I mean, it's amazing. You you read the sort of contemporaneous news articles about the auction. It was, yeah, it was it was like a baseball game. Um, you then obviously have in, in the background from, from the early 70s through the 80s, this incredible wealth creation. And, and it's through that, you know, you've got you, at this point, you now have the Art Basel Fair, you have FIAC in Paris, who both, which both started Art Basel in 1970, FIAC in 74. They started very early and they're beginning to benefit from the money uh, being made around the world post-war. And, the you know, this growing, growing interest in from, you know, not just from the trade, but from people, from wealthy people in, in art. Um, but then, you, you you know, wealth can work in, in all sorts of ways. You get this huge um, recession in the early 1990s. Um, and, you know, New York uh, was really at the centre of, of the wealth creation or the U.S., at that point, and it's almost because of the recession that you start to get these slightly new look fairs, such as what we now call the Armory Show, but which was the Gramercy Hotel Fair, um, in a hotel, much more grassroots, much more, um, you know, no one really, no one really thought about making money. They just wanted to show some contemporary art to people and have a little bit of a little bit of fun. And then on the back of that fair, you get the possibility of, of you know, slightly more um, fun, creative fairs like Freeze. Um, and then Freeze comes, you know, in the early 2000s when, again, we're now seeing big money being made. And it's not just money. It's also globalization. Um, we're all much more connected. We can all fly almost anywhere. The internet is beginning to be a part of people's lives. And at that point, uh, you get, you know, our Basel is the first fair really to go international. That they, they open in the, across the Atlantic. They open in Miami. So you're getting a completely different type of model from the kind of 18 dealers that sat in a tiny room in Cologne in, in the 1960s. And it just, it has followed the macro, a lot of the macro trends of the wider world have, have mapped art fairs and vice versa. And today it seems fairs are very polarizing. Some call them a necessary evil even. <laughs> How did we get into this position where galleries have become so dependent on them? Is that a more recent phenomenon? It's relatively new, but not as maybe not as new as people think. I think um, you know I call art fairs the frenemy. Um, but I think if you <laughs> look back, <laughs> if you remember the first, you know, the first online fair, you remember the VIP art fair yes. that launched in two thousand and eleven, uh, and it was around then people were talking about you know the costs of fairs and the, the cost of travel, the cost to the galleries, and you know how can you. No, you know, if you're a smaller gallery and you're sending all your staff to another part of the world, but you're still paying rent on your space and the cost of it all, they were just mounting and mounting and mounting the more that people were doing. So I think we there were already noises 
around. Um, I think, I mean, what we mustn't forget is the reason why art fairs became so popular is that they worked. They, 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 I mean, they showed more art to more people than anything and, and made set commercial, commercially available art to more people than anything else ever before in the shortest amount of time. And you get, you know, galleries by, you know, pre, pre-pandemic saying, oh my, we sell 45%, you know, on average, 45% of our sales are coming from fairs. Now that it benefits some more than others, but it, it obviously it put the fairs in a, in a great powerful position to be accepted into a, a major league fair was how a gallery felt they'd kind of made it. But then you have this problem of the smaller galleries who have made it in terms of being validated by a huge art fair, but then have to pay tens of thousands sometimes uh, to, to, to be in the fair more on top to get to the fair, more to entertain at the fair. As I say, they're paying their own rent. And because these are often younger, more experimental galleries, what they're showing, the art they're showing costs less. So do they make up their their money? Possibly not. Or they could not sell at all. And that's when you start to get, I had one dealer say to me, you know, you are one or two art fairs away from going under. And that was when it became that was when it became a bit frightening. And you know, never mind the rest of us are exhausted. Whether or not it's good for art was also, you know, debatable. Um, you know, is this the best way to see it? It was, you know, they were efficient, um, but they were kind of running us all into the ground and taking people. There are a lot of complaint, you know, people taking people away from the from the gallery. So I think these noises were definitely there pre pandemic. So the pandemic happens, and that created this period where we didn't have in-person art fairs. Really an unimaginable thought outside of a pandemic. So we get this sort of experiment in a way. Did the lack of in-person art fairs provide us with any revelations uh, to the art world, to galleries, to art fair organizers, to collectors about art fairs and how they had been structured? Oh, it really did. I mean, I I think it actually... revealed two two very important things i think one is that it is possible to work without art fairs the other is it's not possible to work completely online Uh, we do also need them and i think you know they seem like opposites but both became true and i think you know at at the beginning that there was a, a real fear that actually, I mean, I, you know, I, I thought all of our work, I thought we'd all, we'd all end up, you know, retraining. Um, I just didn't think any of us would work again. Uh, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's all events. I mean, the, the art world is a very tactile, physical, in-person art world, and the market especially so. Um, uh, there was, uh, and you know, everyone did incredibly well to go online, and there was a lot of goodwill. Uh, and partly the goodwill of people, you know, helped the market kind of tick for a bit. But then there was this realization, and and again, another great surprise was that people still wanted art. Um, and I, you know, it's a very very happy surprise. But we've got this pandemic. We've got talk of death, illness, industries. We think collapsing, or you know, the hotel industry, the travel industry, all these traditional industries collapsing around us. I I thought the last thing anyone would want was was a painting. But you have conversely, you have people who are in other industries. You know, the if you're in if you if you run Zoom, you're doing terribly well. But if you're in the tech industry in any capacity. those did very, very, very well. So that there's a new breed of, of millionaires and billionaires being added to those that are already there. And those that are already there are sitting in their homes. They're not spending their money on holidays or very you know, fine dining. Um, but they are looking at their walls and thinking, oh, you know, I could rearrange things a bit. I could get a couple more things. We didn't have much to do. The auctions did terribly well in in making themselves, you know, TV shows. Um, I mean, that Sotheby's auction in, in July 2020, which was really the first test of, 
of the auction market um was was a huge was a huge success um and you know for me i was in london and it opened in new york at 7 p.m and from midnight till three in the morning i'm watching an auction so this is mad but um you know I, it was highly entertaining um and that helped bring confidence um and then the other thing so galleries were managing to sell and what they realized is, okay, I maybe don't have the same millions coming in, but I don't have the same millions going out either. So I can sell a bit less and actually be somewhat more profitable. I mean, I think it, it, it sort of went a third, a third, a third. You know, we are actually more profitable without the fares. Um, and I think that gave real pause for thought. Um, you also get a bit of a, there's been this kind of gradual brain drain, hasn't there, out of fares we've had. Noah Horowitz leave Art Basel. Um, Victoria Siddle has gradually left and, and is now leaving Freeze. So, so we, we, there are just some interesting dynamics afoot. The truth, though, is we don't like looking at hundreds and hundreds of artworks on a screen. It just doesn't. It it's, was too. There was too much. Um, and it didn't have that element of that, that, that very important element of physicality. But the other thing that fairs do is, uh, I mean, you know, you, you can go to a fair and you can have 20 conversations in three hours, tw- 20 good conversations in three hours. Maybe they're quick or you've touched base with someone, but you cannot replicate that from day to day. I could try and put in 20 interviews on the same day. Um, but I'm not sure they would, you know, and we may not have anything to talk about. You've all got something to talk about. You're sharing in it together. And I am, I'm sure there are ways of replicating. There will be other ways to replicate that over time, um, but they haven't been found yet. And what we've seen as fairs have come back, albeit in a gradual way, is, again, quite a lot of goodwill. People want them to work. Um, people enjoy seeing each other again. I mean, September till December 2021 were were crazy. But I did end up sort of sitting at Christmas time and thinking, wasn't that what I promised not to do? Didn't I promise not to hurl myself around the world getting too tired and not really getting as much meaning as I could get? And so, But I have met some great people and here are some great business cards. So it's just weighing up those, that, that balance. Um, I, I think we're all still weighing it up. Yeah, I think you're right. And I do think one of the most crucial and rewarding parts about art fairs is the community and reconnecting with people and the relationships you develop and maintain through that. Yeah. And in the peak of COVID, experiencing these online art fairs, and I remember opening up 100 tabs and you know realizing, okay, I just went through an art fair by myself and didn't speak to another person. <laughs> I can't remember which one it was, but a few of the fairs, they did have a chat feature, and I remember trying it out, and I chatted to a gallery, hi, okay. I'm in your booth, yeah. but they didn't respond. <laughs> I guess I don't think it was a priority for okay. them to manage the chat feature. So hopefully if we do continue with these online fairs, there is a level of engagement that can happen and allow us to interact with each other. And that really leads me to my last question. So you have researched in depth the history of art fairs and have also been closely covering fairs for the last several years. What do you think are some possible ways art fairs may evolve as we look forward to the future? Well, I think I think the the, the most obvious uh, change is that you know when when the pandemic struck there were some 300 365 art fairs i think at the last count around the world and and there is no way we're going to still have 365 art fairs um we're already seeing consolidation i mean uh you know f- freezing korea yes they're showing alongside another uh, an existing korean fair but you know let's let's see what happens there and look what's just happened you know since we've we've had a busy busy start to the year look what's happened in paris that fiac which is a actually a perfectly good brand and a brand that was doing well and as i say it existed since 1974 its slot has been taken over by art basel one of the one of the giants of our world so we're definitely we're going to see fewer fairs we're going to see more brand names and listen these are the brands who can attract money in ways other than 
gallery, you know, relying completely on galleries showing up at your event because those numbers are going to go down. The number of galleries that can do the, not the, the same number of first galleries are really rethinking. Some have said, yeah, no, I'm, you know, I'm not doing any more outside Europe. I'm not, you know, and let's see. But there is a definite change, uh, mental change in, uh, to, to gallerists. And you're also getting more of these hybrid gallery weekend, these online efforts. And, you know, there, there will be, I agree with you, you know, the chat functions maybe weren't the best. But there are other little tech things that art fairs themselves are doing. So whether it's, you know, going through virtually on a on an iPad or, you know, talking videos live and just making you feel like, you're there and soaking up some of the atmosphere more than just looking at flat pictures on a screen. But I think we're just, we're going to get to a stage where fairs will exist, but the physical event is not the only important part. It's not the only selling channel. It's not the, um, you can participate in ways that are different. Um, but it, you, the fairs themselves, they will need new they will need a new model of funding and sponsorship is one way. I mean, sponsorship is, is limited to a certain extent, even for Art Basel, the likes of Art Basel and Freeze. But if anyone can attract it, it's going to be the brand names like that. Maybe sort of membership type. I mean, look what look what's happening to TAFAF. TAFAF has, has cancelled again. It's, uh, it's March. It's Maastricht edition or sorry postponed i should say they've postponed it but they've they, you know they've had to keep the money in and is that a kind of member quasi membership scheme are we going to see more of that kind of thing that you you pay to be part of the brand that is basel or freeze whether or not there is a physical fair or you're part of the physical fair and what else do you get well that will be something you know beyond a physical fair so i just think everyone is looking at new ways of funding um, and I think everyone, you know, collectors, galleries, um, everyone has more choice. And we're going to, I think we're going to keep choosing what suits us best. Well, it'll certainly be interesting to follow and see how the art fair model evolves over the next several years. There's definitely been a lot of change already in the last few. Melanie, thanks so much again for coming on the podcast. We really appreciate you joining us and previewing your brand new book, The Art Fair Story, A Roller Coaster Ride, which is available wherever you get your books. Melanie, thanks so much again. Thank you, Adam. Really good to talk to you today. This week's episode of the Art Tactic Podcast is brought to you by ArtBase. Are you managing an art collection, an artist studio, or even a gallery? Is it time to bring your collection management skills up to a professional level? Well, ArtBase is the right software to manage your art business. ArtBase allows you to track your artworks and contacts in an easy-to-use, powerful database. You just enter your data once and use that data to generate reports, offers, contracts, and so much more. And they've got a brand new version out right now with a whole new look that can be used on the cloud from any location on any device. So what are you waiting for? Go to artbase.com to learn more and be sure to mention Art Tactic for a 15% discount.